All right. I really do appreciate you. Ah, so we are recording and I'm going to share the Blackboard screen. I should be able to see that now. Ah, so we are in week 12. Congratulations, by the way, because we're nearing the end of the course. The semester has gone so quickly. And I know, of course, once we hit the holidays, for example, the Thanksgiving week, moving into the Christmas season, this feels even faster. So we're wrapping up week 12 right now, and um, we're going to talk about the week 12 Christian Perspective paper in more depth here in a moment. But to look ahead for what's coming next, we have week 13 with a discussion. And again, I do wanna stress the importance of source citation in APA format and scripture citation in discussions. Um, as I said in a recent announcement, the reason this is so important is because we have so many conversations every single day with friends or with family members, and those conversations generally are not academic evidence-based discussions. We just share our opinion. We maybe give some examples and maybe agree or disagree with somebody else. And that's really pleasant and enjoyable to chat with somebody, but it's not college level discussion. So the difference between a conversation you might have with a relative at the dinner table and a conversation you would have on a formal online discussion board or in seat in a class in the future, if you take a class in person at the college level will involve evidence-based arguments and statements. And so that would be the source citation. It doesn't have to be a direct quote, but we at least need paraphrasing of content from a source with the parentheses author, comma, year, or ND if no date is provided. And then uh, direct quotation obviously is valuable for support and evidence also. And then you can do a little reference page type thing at the bottom of your post, just say references and list just as you would in a paper. So that's the uh, APA format source citation in the discussion for that evidence foundation of what you're sharing. So that it's not just your own ideas and perspectives, which are limited uh, because we all only come from our own worldview, right? But it's that additional depth of analysis. And then the other really quite essential part of discussions in the course would be that scripture citation. So we need at least one reference to scripture, pick a particular verse or a passage. And this is because here at CCU, we have the pleasure and privilege of integrating the biblical perspective in everything we do. <clears throat> uh, one of the courses that I have done here at CCU is research and statistics. And even in the stati statistics course, we've found a way to integrate scripture into our work on a daily and weekly basis. And so how much more does scripture lend itself so easily to topics of general psychology? A little trickier to find those math connections, <laughs> but we do it. But in the psychology course, there's just a myriad of references and opportunities that you can use when you're thinking about scripture passages and verses, stories from the Bible in connection to our course topics. And because that's the unique thing we get to do at CCU, that is not the case at a secular university necessarily. We want to really take advantage of tapping into that biblical perspective and showing our growth in that regard and our mastery and comprehension in that regard, as well as with the evidence-based and source citation, as well as with our personal reflection on our experiences and observations of our own lives and of society at large. So for the discussion, that'll be week 13. And there are several different questions thinking about being created in God's image. You can look ahead at those if you choose. <clears throat> week 14, we have a quiz. And this will be your last quiz. You're all familiar with the quiz structure. Um, I'll be sure to get an announcement out as you begin studying for that so that you know which areas to target. And then week 15, as we have talked about in previous video sessions, is our final paper. Very important for us to be looking ahead and thinking ahead about this final paper. A couple of weeks ago, you submitted a topic proposal for your final, and I returned those just a few days after they were due with comments and feedback in Blackboard. Please review the comments and feedback. Um, if your thesis statement was strong and your topic was appropriate, not too broad or too narrow, you'll just see feedback in that regard saying, great choice, you know, go for it. 
Um, if your topic needed some tweaking or adjustment, then you'll see comments about that too. And you'll see that reflected in the score along with comments regarding your thesis statement submission. And again, that was just a draft thesis statement just a couple of weeks ago for the final paper topic proposal. So if you've not reviewed that feedback, now's the time because the information you got there will give you the opportunity to kind of springboard into the composition of your final. And if, uh, if not that, also to get in touch with me first and say, what, what do you think could be adjusted if there's something that needs to be kind of tweaked a little bit? So that is your opportunity to get more information. Thank you for the feedback. Thank you so much for the final paper. Check out the comments on that topic proposal. Back to week 12, which is what we're talking about and writing about this week. Um, this is a paper about addiction. Addiction is a hard subject, but it is an important part of research and practice in the field of psychology. And remember, when we hear the word addiction, we might think of illicit drugs, we might think of alcohol, but the reality is that addiction can manifest in many different ways. And there are things called behavioral addictions. An example of that might be compulsive, uh, obsessive shopping, and uh, just that need to spend money and to acquire more and more possessions to the point where it's detrimental and problematic and irresponsible and harmful. Harmful. Um, so when we're looking at whether an addiction is under control as, as just a preferred behavior or whether it really is spiraling and manifesting into that full-fledged addiction, we need to just examine whether the behavior is having a harmful effect on ourselves or on the lives of others around us. Obviously, it's essential that we're abiding by guidelines um, outlined for us in scripture and things like that. But speaking purely from a psychological perspective, noticing that harm to self and to others is really what we're looking for when we're trying to determine if we have a problem with addiction. Uh, for instance, reflecting on alcohol. Like I said, drugs and alcohol are the examples that probably come to mind for most of us, but addiction can be much wider spread than that. There are lots of problems for many people with social media and device addiction, screen time addiction. Um, you'll notice, and this may be true for you or just for some others that you know, that you may be using a computer or a tablet, you might have a phone sitting next to you, and you may be having the TV on that you're glancing up at at the same time. And without even realizing it, you are utilizing three different devices at the same time. Um, and that, of course, is not a healthy way to function for too much of our time because we are created to have those natural interactions with other people, time in the word and in prayer, and obviously time perhaps outdoors or with physical activity, we need balance in our lives. And if technology addiction becomes a problem for us that is harmful to our relationships and distracts us from the tasks that we need to do that will be glorifying to God, then it does become a problem. And again, we think about the concept of behavioral addiction. So those are just some things to consider as you proceed. Um, it doesn't just have to be smoking cigarettes. Addiction affects many different populations and groups of people for many different reasons, so whether that is a substance or whether that is a behavior. Um, so for this paper, this will be just two to three pages. So it's pretty straightforward, not too long of a paper. And do, do your best to remain within that three page maximum guideline because these page length prompts are provided to us to help us prepare our knowledge and information and ideas that we plan to share in a contained and limited format, whether that boundary is for a maximum of three pages or a maximum of 10 pages. And you know, with our final paper, there's a lot longer page length requirement, five to six. So in there, you could go all the way up to six. And this week, you're just going up to three. But part of those page length guidelines, an important part of that is practicing just falling within the boundaries that are given academically. And so that's another opportunity for you to summarize your thoughts. I think that writing in a concise and straightforward manner is just as valuable a skill as writing in a detailed and flowery manner. And for some of us who enjoy writing and enjoy words and expression, 
it can be difficult to break things down and summarize them in a more straightforward way. And I myself have had to work on that a lot over time. So it's a great skill to have. Um, and then obviously for the two page minimum, that's two full pages and that does not count the title or reference page. So you just expand and extend the length of your paper to meet at least that two full page requirements. Um, so you obviously can take a look at the rubric. You know, you click on this, click view rubric. And you'll need a strong intro and conclusion. The intro will go through, awesome, thanks Emma, the prompt points and uh, main ideas. You want a strong thesis statement. That might be one sentence. Oftentimes it's just one sentence, especially for such a short paper. Um, outlining the main ideas and those would be those prompt points. And then the conclusion will briefly restate those concepts from the thesis statement just to kind of wrap up your paper and tie a bow on it um, so that the reader is aware of what you've covered and gets a chance to reflect on all of that again as you conclude. The development and the evidence here, you can see that we're looking for personal examples as well as text and scholarly academic sources. So you'll want to cite at least your textbook. Uh, it would be valuable to add a couple others as well, maybe an academic journal article or a website with some statistics. I'm about to show you one here in a moment. And then obviously the integration of the biblical worldview. So we do need the scripture references in there, which we had discussed earlier, the value of that learning opportunity here at CCU with the biblical perspective in mind. So these are the prompt points. You'll first see there's an article for you. You can log in using your CCU username and password, and you'll find this here in the CCU online library. Try and access it sooner rather than later. If you have not already, now's the time, because if you do have any trouble, you wanna set aside time to troubleshoot that, maybe try a different browser or device, contact tech support, let me know, things of that nature. Okay, so you have an article here to read. You can scroll down and uh, the full content article is right here. You can also download it in PDF format by clicking full text PDF if you prefer that layout. So this is um, an article that addresses alcohol dependence, but there are many other important topics that we'll discuss in our paper as well. So we were talking about the source citation in addition to your course text. This would be an appropriate source to cite because you will be discussing the contents of this article. So first, question to be addressing here with the content of the article in mind is what impact does society have on our view of addictions and addicts? So this is your opportunity to really reflect. Think about your own experiences, what you've seen for people who do have addiction, um, and just some of the societal messages that address this topic. So you can consider social media. Again, like I mentioned before, that's such a major influence for people at this point in time. You can consider movies and TV shows. I'm sure that you've encountered maybe a song or something that depicts addiction. And think about the impact of societal messages on your view of people with addiction problems. The next bullet point are some addictions accepted by our society while some are looked down upon. So again, this is where we need to think outside of the box. I'll throw out a random example. Many people are addicted to caffeine. So um, the concept of being addicted to caffeine would mean that that person needs the caffeine, maybe in the form of coffee, <laughs> yeah, for example, in order to function. And some people, when trying to cut back on coffee or to eliminate it altogether, develop some really significant withdrawal symptoms and have severe headaches, maybe even to the point of uh, developing migraine type symptoms and fatigue and feeling lethargic and uh, all of those physical symptoms along with cravings that a person might have can really lead to a manifestation of addiction when it comes to a substance that has caffeine. And am I saying don't drink coffee? No, that's obviously a personal choice um, with your own beliefs and what you feel is best for you physically and mentally. But I'm showing this as an example of an addiction that may be accepted by our society. There are not many people who would judge or criticize a person for ordering a cup of coffee or making one at home. However, some addictions are looked down upon in our society. 
Um, I mentioned several, you know, obviously drug addiction, alcohol addiction. We think about substances like meth. We think about heroin, some of these really intense drug habits um, and some of the problems that can be generated. So do you believe that these are looked down upon generally in our society? And why might this difference occur? Now, remember, you don't have to use what I'm saying right now. Food addiction could be another when somebody compulsively eats and has a lot of trouble stopping, even to the point of physical harm when they're too full and it's causing them problems. Um, so is that accepted by our society or looked down upon? You can share your own opinion or perspective. Take this in whatever direction you choose, as long as you can defend your statements. That's what matters. Does viewing addiction through the biopsychosocial model change your personal views about addiction and addicts? So remember, we've been working with this biopsychosocial model throughout our course. And the biological component is that chemical side of things. Oftentimes in the field of psychology, the biological component would be neurological, hormonal, the endocrine system. Um, and ultimately, if a person has a biological predisposition, for instance, we might consider genetic components to addiction, if somebody is buying into that approach about addiction, then that could impact that person's personal view about addiction or addicts. So review your text, review the article, do some research on that biological component and draw conclusions and your own opinions based on the information that you gather. Psychological approach, obviously that psycho component of the biopsychosocial model. Uh, psychological factors could be people who are dealing with mental health health problems, perhaps severe depression or anxiety, and they may be attempting to self-medicate through the use of drugs, for example. Uh, that could be a psychological factor in addition to this, that psychological aspect of addiction. And that would be the cravings, the obsessive thoughts, the excuses that a person might make, uh, all of that in alignment with maybe some deceptive behaviors, all of this can be manifesting for a person with an addiction problem. And then finally, that social component. So with the biopsychosocial model, social factors are significant in addiction. And that could be the population that a person is spending time with. For instance, if somebody's friends and loved ones and family members are using drugs and that person was born into a home, for instance, where drugs were frequently distributed and uh, shared, and maybe that was a form of income for the family, that person perhaps is much more likely to engage in drug abuse, even for, um, for example, as an attempt to bond with a parent or another adult family member who frequently uses drugs which is very sad, but this is the reality, that social component. Um, if you are a person who does not use drugs, you might say, well, my family never did that and we don't believe in it. And um, you know, in my church, it's just not something that is in my life. Um, but to consider the experience of somebody who's raised differently and often somebody's first dealer is his or her parent. And so considering things with a biopsychosocial model may help us to understand what a person with addiction might have experienced, what they may be going through. For instance, people who've had traumatic events in their lives and maybe are dealing with symptoms of PTSD may fall into addiction as a strategy to numb the pain and to reduce some of that psychological suffering. And uh, so we just want to talk about whether the biopsychosocial model causes us to consider addicts and addiction differently. And then ultimately, awesome, thank you. The final part of the prompt is a Christian response to addiction, pulling back that biopsychosocial model again, as well as scripture. So think about the Bible, the life of Christ, and his response to people um, with lifestyles that were harmful or problematic, and the love that he showed as he helped people to follow him. And consider verses, you can dive into the Old or the New Testament. I showed a website on a video class a while back where we can use open Bible to find scriptures about various topics. For instance, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
um, some, some concepts from scripture like that, that can help us to develop the biblical perspective component of this paper. So you'll want more than one reference to scripture to support your response here. So those are the prompt points for the paper. This topic is hard. Depending on your life experiences, it may be more difficult to talk about this. Perhaps you've experienced um, addiction in your family or in your community or even for yourself. And it may feel really hard to write about this and to research it. So take care of yourself, remain in prayer and in the word and reach out if you need support to those in your life who are here to help you because I know that these topics can be hard. Um, so you're in my prayers as you work through this research process. And I did want to share an interesting source, especially you don't have to use this, but just to kind of get you started as we look at these paper prompts, this is the National Center for Drug Abuse Statistics. And I'm a person who loves statistics. I had mentioned that a little bit before. They are a beautiful way for us to better understand research and social issues and what's going on in the field. Um, so you'll find here information about drug overdose deaths and um, statistics, for instance, 19.4% of people have used illicit drugs at least once, kind of interesting to consider. And obviously there's some response bias with a statistic like that. First of all, are those who participated in this research study or in multiple research studies that produce this statistic, are those people really a good representative sample of the population? And not only that, but would a person answer that question honestly? Do you think in reality that that statistic might be higher or do you think it seems about right? Um, that that's something you can review yourself as you proceed and you're reviewing these and doing your other research. Uh, substance abuse statistics. So more information, um, if alcohol or tobacco are included, 60.2 Americans aged 12 years or older currently abuse drugs. And so that would be used within the last 30 days as uh, what we're considering there. Many other statistics regarding usership. Um, so you can review that, study these statistics a little bit more. First time users, people who have been introduced to drug abuse, there's information regarding opioid abuse. And this would be these uh, prescription medications. Uh, for instance, we might think of Oxycontin as an example of this. Some of these, which unfortunately start out prescribed by a physician and then things get out of control and the person becomes addicted and maybe more and more is prescribed or maybe the person starts doctor hopping is what they might call it and uh, gathering prescriptions from multiple providers or maybe the person starts buying this uh, off of the street because they're unable to get as much as they feel they need to control their pain. This is a very sad and problematic situation and there are many protections in place that physicians have worked with uh, with regulatory entities and agencies to try to make sure that they're prescribing safely and that people are not having the opportunity to abuse the drugs or to give them for the wrong reasons or to overdose. Uh, but obviously, the problem remains, and that would be with these intense pain medications. So these statistics are sad but they are important to review. There's also information regarding deaths related to drugs. And you can continue to learn about depressants versus stimulants. Um, you don't have to go into depth with all of this, but the website, as you can see, it's lengthy. It talks about a lot of different types of substances, moves into alcohol abuse. For more information, there's a link here for a report on alcohol abuse. And this is... Very important. I'll uh, read this last one as we conclude. Interestingly, according to the National Center on Drug Abuse Statistics, 60% of people increased their alcohol consumption during the COVID-19 lockdowns. So 7%, according to this website, of adults who do drink have alcohol use disorder, alcoholism. Uh, AUD is a term that often is being used more recently. Um, so there's information about the deaths that can occur because of this. But with that COVID-19 statistic, I think 
uh, to be in the field of psychology and not to examine the effects socially and emotionally of this COVID-19, the lockdowns and closures and restrictions on the psyches of people across the world and people in the United States, it's a mistake not to consider that because to be alone, to be socially deprived uh, from the interaction that we all were probably used to and to feel fear or concern or stress about the uh, major lifestyle changes that happened very rapidly without much understanding of what was necessarily going on, uh, there is an impact there psychologically for a lot of people. And people will turn to coping skills. And if somebody doesn't know the Lord, it can be easy for unhealthy coping skills to be selected. And some of those would be drug or alcohol abuse. So in my opinion, there's even more research to be done on the impact of social isolation, particularly over the last two years on mental health and on these behavioral and substance addictions. And I look forward to seeing more of that come out. I think investigation here is very important. Um, so that is the story. We could uh, click on the state of Colorado, for instance, and we'll see statistics about uh, alcoholism. Scrolling up to the top, you can see these blue bars here many different pieces of information about drugs and statistics on those in the United States. So with that said, we will wrap up. Time is uh, running out here. So thank you for being here and for working so hard. Congratulations on nearing the end of the course. And we'll end the recording.